So thank you guys for uh, getting up early and coming out to this topic, which uh, I recognize is not the sexiest topic in the world. Um, we're talking about ArcGIS for server security and introduction. And I say that because, um, because security is a non-functional thing. Um, you know, it, it actually technically te tends not to sell software. Uh, you know, people don't go and sit out and say, "Yeah, I'm so glad that you updated those libraries under the hood because they're really bothering me." I mean, we get those fe that feedback, but most of the time, people are interested in GIS. So I appreciate you guys sacrificing some of your time to be with us. My name is Gregory Ponto. I'm a security architect with Professional Services, and uh, I'll go ahead and let my colleague Jeff introduce himself. My name is Jeff Smith. I'm a uh, project engineer on the server and portal uh, development team. And so. Um, you know, my expectation is that most everybody here um, is is not a security expert, um, and if you are, you know that's great. Um, you'll you'll probably get a little bit from this. Uh, we also have a follow-up session right after this one. That's the advanced session, and uh, if you're looking for deep dives in like ciphers and things like that, we'll talk about those there as well as best practices. But here we're going to be talking about the the configuration options with respect to our products and and hopefully uh, demystify some of the, the, con the confusing aspects of security. Because security is confusing. I mean, you're basically taking something that's working well and you're breaking it just a little bit so that people that shouldn't be able to access the system can't. Um, as a result, you know, I often feel like this with regard to security, right? It's, it's changing, it's conf even though I spend my whole world working on it, every year it's different, every year it's new. But my hope is that we can all kind of come to this space, where you know, after we're done, we, we have enough of a foundation where we actually are kind of excited about, about working with it. So uh, we're going to be talking about several concepts, access, authentication, authorization, uh, some somewhat uh, inter-confused concepts, but we'll try to break those down. We'll talk about encryption and certificates briefly, hopefully give you guys enough information to go back and actually implement um, SSL and TLS and HTTPS if you guys are looking to do that, and I'd recommend that you at least uh, attempt that one. Uh, we'll talk about portal and ArcGIS server. That's the whole session is basically about that. Um, these concepts can apply to ArcGIS online um, in some cases, although, uh, uh, again, most of the session content here is really applicable to the, the ArcGIS server or the portal or the combination of both. Um, we'll also talk about some advanced uh, offerings that have come available based on user feedback, enterprise groups, um, and uh, SAML with Portal. And um, oh, the last thing I wanted to say is, uh, uh, before we kind of get into this, is that uh, all these slides and uh, at least some of the recordings will be available um, after the session, so you don't feel the need to commit all of this to memory. Uh, you go, if you go downstairs to the Expo information booth, they can give you more information on how to get those slides. Um, they'll all be available in PDF format to everybody, so things like links and stuff, don't feel the need to like scribble them down real quick. Um, we'll have those slides for you after. And my cards are also up here, as well as Jeff's, um, if you need them. After the fact, you can't get them for some reason. We'll get them to you. So we'll start with access. And access is really about you know, who can log in, who can work with my, my solution. And with regard to access for ArcGIS server, there are, and specifically, we're talking about ArcGIS server right now, um, there are three things to think about. So there's this concept of a user. A user is just a, an, a, a, an agent, a person. Um, sometimes it can be a service account, but it's, it's something that we can identify, helps us to understand that they are actually someone we can recognize. So that's the idea behind what a user is. Usually it's a username and password, not always. Sometimes it's a smart card or a certificate. Those are also valid options. But basically it comes down to a user is the means through which um, we grant access. Now, uh, granting access doesn't necessarily mean that you, ha you can do anything you want. And that's where roles come into play. Roles are a way of, of assigning privilege. So a user gets added to a role. A role gets applied to a service or a folder. The combination of the user being in the role and the role being assigned to the service is how the user gains access to the service. And specifically, this concept I'm describing refers to the user type role. So a, a, you can create multiple roles in ArcGIS server, as many as you want. Um, you know, 5, 10, 20, 100, 1,000. Uh, as much fine-grained uh, access as you want to grant. And, um, and as users are members of these user class roles, 
um, they will be allowed or not allowed to access services. And I mention that because at the higher privilege levels, the administrator and the publisher, those access controls um, change. The, if you're a publisher or an administrator, there is no restriction to the services you can access. Once you grant that role to a group, those people have unrestricted access to the services. The difference there, though, is that a publisher basically has access to change services, publish services, modify services. They don't actually have structural control of the solution. That's where the administrator comes in. So most likely, folks in this room would probably fall into the category of the administrator. Um, these are the people who will have the ability to create a site, delete a site, add a machine to a site, um, configure clustering, uh, these kinds of very structural changes that have large impacts to the solution. Obviously, they also have the ability to publish services and everything kind of below this list. So the permissions roll up from user to publisher to at the top level administrator. Another thing we want to think about is this concept of an identity store. An identity store is a database or a file system where we store the users and or the roles. So we'll kind of jump right into that, that consideration because it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to think about, especially initially. Where do I want to store my users and where do I want to store my roles? And by default, if you don't do anything, they're going to be stored in the ArcGIS server's um, config store, basically a built-in database, also called built-in um, built identity store. So what you really want to, want to do when you consider where I want to store my users is to ask yourself the question, where are they coming from? So if, if you can be sure that all of your users are internal users, and that doesn't necessarily mean internal to the network, but it basically means that, for example, you have an Active Directory and you're sure that anyone that you'd ever want to have secure access to your system would have an Active Directory account or an LDAP account. Um, that would be an example of, of an, an internal um, user store. And uh, the consideration here is if you, if you perceive that you might want to grant um, access beyond just your, your Active Directory or your LDAP, um, then you, you're kind of in this camp where you, have, you need to support external users that actually have logins. So the, 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 the ultimate decision point here is if your users are internal, you're going to have a better experience with using an Active Directory or LDAP-based user store. And if you need to support um, additionally support like, for example, contractors or individuals like that who may not be in your Active Directory, your IT department's not going to grant them access to, your, to their Active Directory, then you'll go with the, the built-in, which is basically the default. The built-in is more flexible, um, but it doesn't have as good of an experience for you, an administrator, or necessarily as, as good an experience um, for your users because they're going to have to type in passwords and you lose things like single sign-on, stuff like that. So a, a role store is a similar kind of um, decision point. Uh, we can do, you could do users maybe from our Active Directory because realistically managing passwords is not likely what you all went to school to do. Uh, most everybody here you know, are GS professionals and they're here to work with geospatial data. Um, not necessarily uh, looking to be an Active Directory administrator. Um, so often people will choose to use the user store from their Active Directory. Now the role store is, a, um, is, is, is more of a, more of a you know, what do I want to do um, kind of decision. So do you want your, your, you, your, your access to be controlled or managed by you, or do you want your IT department to manage access to your, your ArcGIS server? And that will govern the choice to use an enterprise, which is like an Active Directory or LDAP-based um, role store, or a built-in store. So the default is the built-in store. It basically means that, every, that you are in complete control. Um, you, will, you will create the role, you will add users to the role, and you will add that role to the services and grant access. If, uh, if, if someone comes in new to your organization, you're going to have to be on top of adding that user to the appropriate role and having that role assigned to the right group. If you choose the enterprise identity store, 
what you would do is you would, you would have pre-existing groups, like in, you know, I reference Active Directory because it's the most common one we see, but LDAP would work too. So you have predefined groups in your Active Directory, you'd say like maybe GIS users, and then maybe engineering, and then maybe water, and whatever. Um, and then your Active Directory administrator would be responsible for adding users to those groups. And you would only have to predefine what those groups have access to in your server. So um, it helps you lean a little bit more in your IT department. It's what I recommend if you can do it. Um, because this, a lot of people say, well, I really want to manage everything myself. And then six months later, I'm talking to them again, and they go, I really want to get away from that. Um, because it it's, it's, seems like a good idea initially, but it, as your infrastructure grows, um, it becomes a, you know, a, 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 an administrative headache. So, um, so if you can lean on your IT department, I recommend it. Oh, yes. You can do a mixed mode, yeah. So you can do a mixture of, uh, so the question is can you, can you do both? And I'll say yes with some caveats. So you can do, um, we'll talk about it in a second, mixed mode, um, where basically you choose to have users from your IT department and roles governed by you. That's the, that's kind of the, sort of the best of both worlds. You, you don't lose, you don't, it doesn't, doesn't get you in the space of resetting people's passwords, which can really be um, tedious. Uh, but then you, you can control access to groups. Um, so that would be kind of an example of doing both. So as to the identity store, as I kind of mentioned, um, there are, there are th three ways to do it. So there is a built-in, the built-in default option. It's like you do everything. You create users, you create passwords, you manage who has access to what. Um, and and it's, it's a more flexible option, but it's more work. And uh, it doesn't provide as, um, as good an experience for you or your users. If you can, um, I would suggest using an enterprise identity store. Because again, your IT department already has these investments in your infrastructure, presumably. And um, it's I ideally you can just leverage them, right? So don't, don't do it yourself if you don't have to. And then there's, uh, as I just mentioned, the ability to do uh, what we call mixed mode, which is basically choosing to do users from maybe your domain, your Active Directory, your LDAP, um, and then you might do a built-in role store where you're the one that's going to go, well, okay, I'm going to say that these users go into these groups. Um, so that, that's another option there. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jeff. Uh, he can kind of show us how that works. All right. Thanks, Greg. Let's get my screen on here. All right. I just want to show you a quick demo of the built-in user, user and role store. So let me sign into the server manager page as an administrator. And once you're signed in, you need to go click on security at the top. And the screen that comes up here shows you the configuration settings. And right now, uh, as Greg mentioned, the default user store is built in, the role store is built in, and um, the GIS uh, tier authentication and, and token authentication mode. Now, <clears throat> if we leave it at built in, what we can do is we can go to users. And it is the GIS administrator's responsibility uh, to create users, assign passwords, and assign to roles, as Greg had mentioned. So we'll go ahead and create a new user here. Be very creative with the uh, password. And create that user. And now we'll go ahead into roles. And again, similar to users, you will, you've got a button over here to create a new role. Click on that. And maybe I want to create this role and call it secure. Um, this is the option down here. You can give it a description if you'd like. And the role type, as uh, we saw on the, um, uh, the previous slide, you can do user, publisher, administrator. We'll have this role be a user uh, type role. You can also add usernames directly from this point. I'll go ahead and add the demo user that I just created. And we're good to go. As, so as an administrator with built-in, you've got complete control over this. And it's your responsibility to create these users, maintain passwords. But it's all done right here in the ArcGIS um, server manager page. OK, so next we'll move on to authentication. And authentication is basically a way of verifying my identity. It's like a way of saying, you know, I know who you are. Um, without that, we can't really make very many decisions on, wh on who to grant access to what. There are two options with regard to ArcGIS server in terms of the authentication tier you can use. The default is the GIS tier. And we, you'll sometimes hear this term. We use tokens to authenticate, or tokens are used. And tokens are just an a encrypted string that 
uh, are like a key that our software uses internally to validate and grant or revoke access. Um, this basically means that the ArcGIS server application is going to be in charge of authentication. The other option, and it's and and by the way, if you're if you're not sure which to pick, um, the default again is the GIS tier, and that's where most people start. It's usually a conscious decision to go to a web tier um, authentication, and I say that because it comes down to wanting to support a third-party authentication technology or a capability of a web server that you want to leverage. That's where we get to web tier authentication. So if you're not sure which one to pick, you'll invariably start here and um, you might decide at some point to move towards web tier authentication. I mentioned the web adapter uh, here because the web adapter is a component required for web tier authentication. It has a number of other capabilities but it's basically a tool that we provide at no cost. It comes with the ArcGIS server product and the portal product um, to leverage capabilities of your web server, uh, a third party web server. So this would be like IIS, uh, Tomcat, uh, any Java application server, all those would, would work. And um, it has other capabilities like for example, if you want an easy way to translate ports from, from the default port that our product comes with, which is 60, 60, 80, and 6443 to 80 and 443. The web adapter also is often deployed um, to provide that capability. It's just kind of like an, uh, um, an Esri provided, um, fully integrated, easy way to do this. There are lots of other ways to accomplish this task though. Um, this, but, the, but the main thing is that for web tier authentication, you're going to want to use the web adapter. So in terms of GIS tier authentication, which is the default, um, the way this, this works, the way the authentication layer occurs is you have a client kind of out here and they, they make a request either directly or through a web adapter uh, implementation, which is, this is not necessarily required but we're showing it here. So the client makes a request to the web adapter and in this case the web adapter is not doing anything. It's just forwarding that request to the GIS server. The GIS server then sends that request or, or attempts to authenticate that user via the identity store. This would be like the Active Directory, the LDAP, um, custom database, built in, etc. If authenticated, the GIS server mints an Esri token at that moment and sends it back to the client. And the client just starts using that token to access services. Web tier authentication is a slight variance of the same idea. So here we have a client that makes a request to the web server. In this case, the web adapter is required because the web adapter uh, via the web server's um, libraries makes a call to the same identity store. This would again be your Active Directory, your LDAP. It validates the user. If validated, the web adapter, uh, the, if validated, the web adapter then passes the request to the GIS server. But in this case, the GIS server doesn't, doesn't check again. It trusts the web adapter. So it says, hey, if the web adapter has authenticated this user, I'm good to go. And again, the idea behind this is that this enables you to leverage um, more advanced authentication methods like, like single sign-on with integrated Windows authentication, um, smart cards, PKI, certificates, um, whatever, your web whatever your web server basically supports. So just kind of a decision matrix in terms of, you know, which one do I want to choose, which one do I want to pick. The default is the GIS tier or otherwise sometimes described as the token, um, uh, token authentication. If you want to support public access, the easiest way to do it is through GIS tier authentication but it is possible with the web adapter and this is in our help. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a little bit more effort. What you basically end up doing is deploy two web adapters, one public, one private. Um, and that way you can get public or anonymous access. So it's a little bit, just a little more effort to do it with the web tier, but you can. In terms of which clients support which tiers, um, the GIS tier model is an Esri proprietary authentication model, which means it's best used with Esri software. So if you're using Esri apps, Esri APIs, Esri clients, then it's just, you know, it's just all built in. It's going to work fine. If you're using non-Esri technologies, those technologies often have to be modified 
to support the token authentication model. And in some cases, that's why people will go with the Web2 authentication approach. For example, OGC um, doesn't support uh, Azure proprietary token security, so, but it does support HTTP security or HTTP authentication. So that would be a, a, a reason to do that. The, the most common reason, though, um, to, to use Web2 authentication is to utilize these uh, more advanced authentication methods, uh, such as like single sign on. That's kind of the most common one I see. And we'll go ahead and turn it back to Jeff to show us how to select an authentication method. All right. Thanks, Greg. I'm back on the uh, server manager page here. I'm going to log in once again as an administrator and go to the same tab I went to previously, the security tab. And again, like I described uh, earlier, the user and role store are built in right here, and the authentication tier and authentication mode, like uh, Greg has been describing, is identified right here. Now, if I want to change this to use integrated Windows authentication, I just need to click on the pencil button, the edit button right here, next to configuration settings. Now, these are the options that, that Greg just described where you know, this is user and roles built in, the users uh, and roles are both from an existing enterprise system or the mixed mode that he described where it was users are from an enterprise system, the roles are built in. In this case, I'll choose that last option. And again, for the enterprise store, you can choose Windows Domain, which is Active Directory, or an LDAP. I'll keep it there. And you just need a, a username and password to connect in. I'll hit Test Connection, make sure it looks good and hit next. Now this option right here, this is the authentication tier. And again, this you can choose to have integrated, or excuse me, you can choose to have um, enterprise or Windows users and still have GIS to your authentication if you'd like. And that not was like have the mixed mode tier. approach. Yeah. Um, but it, you'd select it right here. And in, in this case, if we want to choose web tier authentication, you'll notice a little header at the top that says it requires the appropriate configuration of your web adapter. and We'll hit next, and this is the, the final summary of what we're going to change. Now, for this demo, I'll show you what needs to be done with NIS, but I'm going to leave it at the built-in mode for uh, future demonstrations that I'm going to do later on. So I'll go ahead and cancel out of this. But normally, you would hit finish here, and the next step would be to open up your IIS. And you'd have to go into IIS, expand the sites and the default website, and in this case, I've got two web adapters installed. I've got portal and server. But the server, if you're going to be choosing to use integrated Windows authentication, you're going to have to go to select the server web adapter and adjust the authentication uh, on that web adapter. And the icon right here in IIS uh, has the little padlock next to the person. And you'll need to disable the anonymous access and enable the Windows authentication. Once those two steps are done, your server's ready, the, the web adapter is going to be authenticating any users that are going to be trying to access the URLs, and the ArcGIS server is going to be anticipating that authentication at the web adapter level, and we'll be able to uh, determine, um, be able to authorize the user and determine what the user has access to. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, oh, dim the lights. Is that, is she, can we dim the lights? Oh, no, no, no. Can we, can we dim the lights a is little bit? Is it possible bit? to dim the lights over there? Or is it, is it that? Well, I'll have, I'll have our assistant work on it. Um, so authorization is a little bit different from authentication, and they're often confused. So authentication is, again, is who I am. But authorization is what I can what I can actually access. So just because I have an ID card doesn't mean I can get in every door in this conference, right? I only have access to certain things. And that's what we're going to talk about here. It's actually really simple to do. Um, you simply adjust the configuration or the, the security of either a folder or a service in ArcGIS Server Manager, and Jeff will show this in a second. You can choose, you choose to grant or remove a role from, again, either a folder or a service. Now, but, and that's it. That's all you do. So once you've got like, all the, the web tier authentication or the GS tier authentication configured, it's just a simple couple of clicks to change the privilege um, 
grant and remove roles from either services or folders. Now, all services by default are published as public, and I just kind of alert you to that um, because it is possible to publish a service and, and kind of not realize that it, was, it wasn't really locked down, um, which can be, you know, may not be a problem or it can be a, a very serious problem. So uh, when, you, when you publish your services, be, be aware that they are anonymous by default. And, uh, you know, this is a security session, so we talk about, you know, anonymous access means anyone can access the service. If it's a feature editable service, that means anyone can edit your data. Um, so that's something to just keep in mind. Uh, to be on top of that when you're publishing services is to is to ensure that they are they are locked down uh, appropriately. So I'll go ahead and turn it back to Jeff for a demo okay. on how to do that. Thanks, Greg. All right, I'm back in the server manager page again. Let me log back in once again. Now the security configuration can be defined at the service level or at the folder level, and you can identify whether services are secured or not based on the padlock over here. And so you see all these services again by default. They're all uh, open and avail accessible by everyone. Uh, likewise, for the, the folder, uh, if, you were, if I were to create a new folder, that would, by default would be uh, open to everyone. And I'll show you an, another way that <clears throat> some of you are probably familiar with is accessing the, uh, the REST page or the REST services directory. And this shows that this page is primarily used by developers to show what operations are available for individual map services or feature services, that stuff, to incorporate them into web applications. But for this demo, I'll, I'll use this as a means to show you what happens with secured services. So now let me jump back to the ArcGIS Server Manager page. And what I want to do is secure this state's uh, map service down here. So I'm going to click on the padlock next to the state service. And by default, it says it's public, available to everyone. That's correct. We, um, so if I switch this to private, and now I select what role that I want to secure it with. And the role, this is the one I just created previously called secure. And we know the demo user I would create it as a member of that. So I, I go ahead and add the secure, allowed roles, and click Save. Now you'll see the padlock now shows that it's locked. And if I jump back to the tab, back to the rest services page, and let me refresh this page, you'll notice that the state's map service disappeared down there. So now, it, in theory, with it, with it gone there, if I were to try to access states directly through the URL, server's going to say, hey, you need to authenticate. I'm not letting you through this unless you tell me who you are, and I'll determine if you've got access to this. So I'll put in the username that I just created, the demo user, click login, and now I've got full access to it. All right, thanks, Jeff. So now we're going to jump from access and authorization to encryption. And encryption is, is not to really be mixed up with identity. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the means by which we, we translate uh, data that is readable to something that is uninterpretable by prying eyes. Um, the way we do that is through HTTPS. And uh, there, there at one time was kind of a debate, and I've been doing this for a few years. We, we used to talk about should you use this, and we had a decision matrix, and um, you know whether or not it was appropriate to use HTTPS in your environment. Uh, that debate is over. You should use it. Um, <laughs> it you know, it, the and, and really the thing that's kind of sealing the deal is not not Ezra's opinion. Um, it's organizations like like Google that are starting to disable capabilities in their browsers. And uh, D, um, D, uh, uh, sort of reduce the like search engine optimization results when you don't use uh, HTTPS. So uh, sort of the world is 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 pushing everyone in this direction. And uh, the other the other reason why it's uh, it's really kind of a no uh, it's, it's really kind of a non discussion point. It used to actually cost. Um, in terms of CPU cycles, it was a, it was a higher cost. There was performance implications. With modern ciphers, that's really a non-issue. Actually, smartphones have a lot to do with that because smartphones don't have particularly powerful processors, and modern ciphers have been designed to enable smartphones to do encryption. So um, your 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 typical server has a vastly more power and capability than a smartphone, um, and it can use the same uh, encryption to 
to uh, secure your, your transaction. So it's really, an, uh, really not a debate anymore. You should really just use it. Uh, as a result, it is enabled by default. So um, if you're using uh, ArcGIS Server or Portal 10.4 or later, actually with Portal it was always enabled, but um, with ArcGIS Server 10.4 or later, it's enabled by default. So if you're already there, you're done. If you're installing it new, we're already done. Um, but you can always change it, even if you're using an older version, 10.3, um, 10.2, it's, it's, a, it's a setting within the ArcGIS Server Administrator directory. And uh, what you just do here is you just you pull down the, uh, there's a drop down menu, and you s just select um, either HTTP and HTTPS, or um, if possible, uh, support HTTPS only. Now, uh, the, the real challenge with HTTPS is that it requires certificates. And uh, we'll, I'll uh, have you guys hold questions till the end of the session, because we have a bit of content to get through. Um, but with HTTPS, uh, you do have to deal with certificates. And certificates are kind of the big hassle here. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a standard called X509. Um, it is not a simple standard. Um, and it is, it is designed to provide identity and, and encryption, um, sometimes called, you might hear the word PKI. That's what it is. It stands for Public Key Infrastructure. Um, that's what certificates is all, is all based on. And, um, by default, ArcGIS Server has one set up for you. So it, it mints its own certificate on setup. Um, so you don't necessarily have to implement a CA signed certificate, but we do recommend it for production sites because if you don't use a, CI, a CA signed certificate, and CA stands for Certificate Authority, so that's like VeriSign, Digistore, groups like that, um, you'll see messages like this. Uh, it can also prevent uh, server applications or um, uh, scripts to fail that might require HTTPS to be valid. And um, uh, this does not necessarily mean that encryption isn't in place. It is encrypting. So there is, it is actually safe in terms of encryption. But it just means that the server can't, the client or the server can't successfully identify um, that the person with the certificate is who they say they are. So for those that are, and I would recommend that you, you look into this. Those that are, are looking to set up a valid CA signed certificate, um, there's a lot of ways to do this, but there's a, there's a fundamental process that you go through. It all starts with a certificate signing request. Web servers can mint these. Um, ArcGIS Server and Portal can create, the, you can create these in the administrator directories of ArcGIS Server and Portal. Um, a CSR is just an encrypted string which contains information about your system. That encrypted string is sent to a certificate authority for signing. Now, um, I, would, I would advise everybody here to uh, talk to your IT department, see at, at initially if they have a certificate authority available to you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a standard, more of becoming a standard thing these days that IT departments um, implement on-site certificate authorities. Uh, if they do, it might actually be just a click of a button for you to get one. It can actually be very easy. Um, but if not, you can work with a, with a certificate authority like, um, like Digicert is the one we work with a lot. Um, and and, it, and they, they're helpful. If, if, if the process is confusing, you can call them, say, I've never done this before. That's a very common question. They get that all the time. Um, they'll say, you know, give me a CSR. You'll, you'll be able to create one of those. Um, they'll handle most of the work and signing it. They'll give you back a file. And they'll, they'll usually help you out on even where to put it. And uh, once, the CS, once the CA provides a certificate file back to you, it's usually a .cer uh, file, you can import that signed certificate into your web server, into your ArcGIS server, into your portal. And um, if, this is, uh, if, if this is not an effort you want to take on alone, um, my team works in professional services. So we, we do this um, as a service for people as well. You can take my card. Um, it, Usually doesn't take that long. Uh, it, we can, you know, we can at least uh, talk about doing it as like an, 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 you know, initial just kind of discussion to kind of get you in the right track. And I'll uh, go ahead and turn it over to Jeff to show us how to get a valid certificate. All right, thanks, Greg. I want to uh, demonstrate this. This can be done within, certainly within ArcGIS Server and the administrator directory. But a more common place where this is done is within the web server where the web adapters installed. And so I just want to walk through a real simple uh, how to do this in IIS. 
So I just opened up the IIS manager page, uh, or the manager application right here. And you'll notice there's the server certificates. If I double click on that, right now I currently have two certificates uh, already already out there. And the, the key difference, the issued to is the name of the, the sort of the domain name in my URL. Uh, but the issued by shows where they, who signed them basically. This one down here is, is a self-signed certificate. That means my computer created it and signed it itself and, and no one else is really gonna be able to trust the certificate um, because no one else knows about necessarily my, my computer. Um, the other one right here is what Greg had described with uh, a do what's referred to as a domain certificate. That means the Esri domain signed the certificate. And for those, the Esri domains, any computer within the Esri domain will, will trust that by default. If you take a computer outside of the Esri domain though and that tries to access this, it's not gonna trust it and you'll get the pop-ups that uh, we saw on the slides warning you saying, all right, are you sure you wanna access this? Now, like Greg described, the first step in creating a brand new SSL certificate is to generate a CSR. So up here under actions is the create certificate request. This will bring up this page. The most important part here is the common name. The common name is the actual, the host name of the URL that's, uh, that's gonna be accessed, or the, the URL, or the host name of the machine um, where the web server resides. So in this case, it's my jsmith.esri.com. Uh, the organization, uh, this is when you submit this CSR to a certificate authority, this is how they are gonna identify you and a lot of times they will come back to you to verify, okay, who submitted this certificate and are they, are they who they say they are, do they work for this organization, uh, et cetera. So this information needs to be put in and then we'll go next, ask you the bit length, be used. Typically, I'd recommend at least the 2048. Um, and click next. And now all it asks is a, a file name. We're going to save this out in a text file. I'll overwrite what I've already got out there. And we hit finish. Don't want to overwrite. Yes. All right. And so this is the C, the uh, the CSR or the certificate request that you'd have to supply to the certificate authority. Double click on it, open it up. As Greg described, it's an encrypted, long encrypted string. All the information that we just typed in is included in that, but it looks like garbage from this point. Um, but this is exactly what they need, the certificate authority needs to generate a signed certificate that they'll send back to you. Once they send it back to you, let me go back to my IIS here. Uh, the, the last step is to import it, or the next step is to import it back into uh, IIS. And so we'll complete the certificate request, and we will select the file that they supplied back. And again, as, as Greg mentioned, it's typically a .cer file. In this case, it's demo.cer. And the friendly name, this is just so you know uh, what it is identified in that list. It bear, this bears no meaning to uh, the SSL certificate itself or doesn't impact it. Hit OK, and it imports it. Now you'll see there's the, the name that I gave it. And the other the key thing is to see it's issued by the Esri Enterprise root. In this case, this is a domain certificate that I had previously generated. Um, if you were to get it signed by a, a well-known certificate authority like DigiCert, VeriSign, whatnot, the issued by would, would display that name right there and you know what it is. Now the last step is to tell IIS to use that certificate you just imported. So you'd have to go to default website and bindings over here. Double click on HTTPS. And then you've got a drop down list right here showing the uh, SSL certificates to select from. And so if I wanna use the one that I just imported, I'd select the sample SSL, and click okay and close. Now I'm giving you this information to kind of give you an understanding of what's going on here, but typically your IT department more than likely will be the ones doing this. Uh, but this sort of gives you an understanding of, of some of the requirements, what's going on behind the scenes for this. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. So, John, that certificate is always assigned to a port. It's, it's told to just talk on that port. It's, it's assigned to any, any, anything, any port used by IIS. It's not assigned to, yeah, it's not port specific.
So now we'll kind of jump over to Portal for ArcGIS. Everything you saw so far is is relative to ArcGIS server. Now we're kind of moving into the Portal space. Um, the concepts are actually very similar. There's slight adjustments, but you know, kind of under the covers of framework is is very similar because, of course, written by the same company and has kind of a similar goal. So um, we'll talk about two areas or two ways to kind of use Portal with ArcGIS server. One is is registering services, and the other is to federate a server. And you might actually use a combination of both. The first is the, is the register server, a register service approach. Uh, when you first deploy Portal, this is likely how you're going to start, and that's fine. You can do this all day long, and then you can switch gears later, and it's not going to hurt you. Um, but the idea here is that your Portal for ArcGIS um, is going to be like a content management system. It's going to store metadata about your service, but not actually um, serve your service. So it's like a directory. Users open up a portal, they search, they find what they're looking for, hopefully, um, as opposed to kind of the older way of working where you expose the REST services directory and they kind of had to have a a lot of expertise to, to even know how to deal with URLs and stuff. Portal's designed to kind of eliminate that and make it easier for your users. And here we're just going to take an ArcGIS server web service and we're going to register it with Portal. Now that does mean that the ArcGIS server is really unchanged. It doesn't know it's been registered. It doesn't care. Um, it has its own identity store and it actually doesn't even have to be um, on the same site or it doesn't have to be the same version. So it's a, it's a lot, it's a very flexible way to go. You could actually add other remote um, services to your portal and, and represent them to your users that way. Um, portal in this case will maintain its own separate identity store so you kind of have a, a mashup of, of two, potentially two security models. And I mention that because with Portal you're really, when you secure Portal you're securing items but you're not necessarily securing the service. Um, now sometimes items are data so it's important to secure those, to, to not share them with everyone unless you really want them to be public. Um, but but the, the key here is that when you have a web map in Portal and you secure it, it does not mean that the service behind it is secure. It's a common mistake. Um, if someone was, and it, it doesn't take a lot of effort to discover the service because it's, it's in the map document. Um, and then someone can actually circumvent the security and go directly to the service. So we see this happen um, from time to time with this, uh, this pattern. So just kind of reiterate that um, when, it, when we say you know, secure an item in Portal, uh, when it comes to web maps and applications, these are basically like you're securing the metadata. You're not really securing the actual data. It's just a pointer. Um, now packages can contain data. Data obviously is data. Those things can also be uploaded to Portal. And it's important to secure those and, and you don't really have to think much else beyond that. Um, but with ArcGIS Server, that's really kind of the kind of the bottom line. That's where your data is being fed from. So um, you actually could, could ignore um, some of these security items in Portal as long as you really made sure that your ArcGIS server was properly secured. And that would be, an, that would be a valid way, um, that would be a valid way to work. So how do we set security? Well, with Portal for ArcGIS, um, there's this concept of ownership. So I publish an item or I create a service, I own it. Um, and so as the item owner, I have the, the power to set privilege and permission. Now, um, it, most likely the folks in this room are going to have an administrator level privilege to your portal. You can override that. So you can go into people's items and change how they've shared them and that sort of thing. Um, with ArcGIS Server, that was a, this is a kind of a de departure, right, from ArcGIS Server, um, where any publisher or administrator really had full access to everything and could uh, set everything and there was no concept of ownership. So kind of the difference is that in Portal, there's a concept of ownership and those owners can, can share items and uh, manage privilege and in, in server it was really always done by the administrator. So it's a, it's a, it's a potentially a way where you can um, shift some of the burden of, admi of administering the security onto your users um, if you, if you uh, trust them sufficiently to do that. And you don't have to, you can do it all yourself too if you want. So uh, we talked about authentication with ArcGIS Server, uh, choosing you know, what, if we're going to use Web2 authentication or GS2 authentication, built-in um, identity stores. The same concept is true of Portal. Uh, with Portal, you have three, three options. It's, it's a, um, you, go, you can go a little bit further than you did with Server. So you have the, tr the Web2 authentication we've already talked about, the Windows authentication. That's uh, web adapter based. 
Um, you can also do built-in, which, which is basically like GIS tier. In this case, Portal is doing the authentication. But there's a there's another um, feature of authentication with Portal called Identity Federation. You'll sometimes hear this term SAML. Um, it's my favorite capability of Portal because it truly does give you the most flexible option. It is, it gives you single sign-on with your enterprise identity store, but it can also give you built-in users to support contractors and things like that. So, so wherever possible, I, I prescribe SAML, 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 SAML. The problem, or I guess the challenge with SAML, is that it does require uh, a, what's called an identity provider. There's a couple of products that do this. Active Directory has one called Federation Services. It's called Active Directory Federation Services. Um, there are uh, open source technologies. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a company called Okta that does this as well. Um, Azure has an has a identity, identity store, or identity provider, I should say. Uh, this is really a question for your IT department. Do you guys have, you can say, do you guys support SAML? Do you guys have an identity provider? Um, if they look at you funny, then I would say move to one of these. Uh, but it, if, they, if they say, yes, we do, then it's, it really is kind of a no-brainer to do that. Um, it's going to give you the best experience. It's going to give you the most flexible um, options. And it can enable you to support uh, contractors uh, and, and people that are not actually in your, um, in your organization if you need to. So kind of a little bit of a decision matrix here. If your organization has an identity provider, use SAML. If they don't, go with, if you can, Active Directory or LDAP-based uh, uh, identity store because that's going to take the burden off of you um, and make and give your users a better experience in terms of working with Portal. That'll still give you like single sign-on, which a lot of people want. That's like the most commonly at request feature I get. You know, I need to get single sign-on. My users are tired of typing in usernames and passwords. But if you have, if you don't have these co infrastructure components, um, or you need to support external users and you don't have SAML, then you can still do built-in. Um, Built-in is not wrong. It's the default. It's still it's very flexible, but it just puts all the burden of administering users on you, and I don't want you to have to, to have to do that if you can avoid it. So authorization uh, again is slightly different from authentication. Uh, this is where we we determine what users can do. We know who they are, but we don't know what they can do. So authorization is how we do that. And in Portal, there's two ways we handle authorization. There's a concept of roles. Roles is is what you can do, it's, it's, the, it's the verb. Um, and basically, uh, with roles you have, you have three starting options, users, which are what e most everyone will be. Um, users can create items, uh, they can create web maps, but they cannot publish. Publishers are like users who can publish. And administrators have complete control of the portal. They can, they can um, take the portal down, they can restructure the interface, um, likely, again, most everybody here is going to be in that administrator boat. And it's also possible to create custom roles. But there's a one-to-one -one relationship between users and roles. So you can only have one role to one user. Um, but that's where custom roles can kind of be handy. You can create a superset of capabilities um, and create a custom role to give you, um, if you want kind of a publisher plus, you can do that. If you want a user minus, you can do that. Uh, also, with groups now, um, groups are how we grant access to stuff. It's like the noun. So this is like the verb. This is like the noun. Um, what can I access? Users are a member of a group. Items are shared with a group. Combine them together. That's how they get access. So I kind of briefly mentioned that, but we'll dig into this a little bit more. So a, a collection of users is, is called a group. So you create a group. You invite users to a group. You add items to a group. Um, that's how we grant access to things. Things are items. Things are web maps, data, web apps, services. Items, items, as I said, are shared to the group. Combining the two gives us the access we want. Group owners have the ability to create, to add um, users. They can approve new members. So um, if, a, if a member comes along and they say, I really want access to this secured group, they can apply for access, but they don't. They have to be approved. Um, as the administrator, you can override all of that, of course. So I said uh, groups are like the noun, they're like the things, the items. Roles are the actions, so what do you want to do? Um, again, one-to-one -one relationship, one, uh, every user can only have one role. Uh, the default roles, again, are the user, which is like the, you know, I say it's the lowest level of privilege, but it's also the most common. It's basically how people, it's what most people will be, and they'll get access to things. 
Um, and well, I shouldn't say that. Yeah, they'll get access to things, but they'll also have. They won't have privilege to publish, basically. Now, publishers are like users who can publish, and administrators, that's everything. They can override privileges. They have complete control. Um, reserve the administrator privilege to, obviously, a narrow set of individuals, because they can, they, can, they can completely redo the whole portal. They can take the whole thing down. It's a powerful privilege. And custom roles um, are possible to provide more fine-grained control the most common custom role I find myself implementing. And again, you know, in pro services, we go on site, we do workshops, uh, we find out what are your needs exactly. And uh, this one uh, is a common one I, I find is that um, organizations will say, well, uh, I really just want my users to be able to consume. And so we'll, we create this viewer template, but there's a, there's a lot of templates in there. You could just create a completely custom role if you wanted. And uh, in this example, if I, if I were to create a role called the viewer template, um, that would automatically set all the privileges for me to just have consume. So that would mean the user can't do anything but discover and use items. Now, you can extend that if you want. Kind of the sky's the limit. There's a lot of privileges here uh, to give you the kind of the exact user role you're looking for. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff for a demo on uh, securing web services with Portal. All right. Thanks, Greg. I just want to do a quick demo here of registering a secured service within Portal. So let me go ahead and sign into Portal as an administrator. And from this point, if I go to my content, um, I've got one item there, but I'm going to go ahead and click on Add Item from the Web. Now what I want to do, the service that I secured previously, that uh, state's map service, I want to go ahead and add or register that item in Portal. So I've already copied the URL. I'll go and paste it here. This is the uh, exactly what we looked at earlier. <clears throat> now, this window comes up. I definitely I need the username and password in order to access this. But n now I've got an option. I can store the credentials or not. Uh, what does that mean? If I select to store the credentials, that basically means I'm overriding the security in ArcGIS server. I'm, I'm saving the credentials and I'm letting Portal send those credentials anytime that item is being accessed. And then that means I'm shifting the security for that service uh, to however it's secured within Portal. If I secure it in Portal to allow everyone to use it, suddenly I've, I've overwritten the security altogether. And what once was thought of as a secured map service is now accessible by, by, by anyone. And so that's something to consider. Um, likewise, if you choose to say, OK, well, I want this to remain secured, and I only want this demo user or, or people, uh, certain individuals to access this, and I don't want to store credentials, this could impact when you put it into your web application and bring it up, you're going to be prompted to enter credentials. And so I'll show you what I'm talking um, the rest endpoint remains secure, but if you choose to uh, store the credentials, then the item, you would go through the item to access it. But in this case, I'm going to choose not to store the credentials, and I'm going to add the item. Now, what happens to, to give you an idea of what's uh, happening here, if I add the layer to a new map, the new map will pop up. But in order to view the service, I'll be, have to enter the username and password once again. Now, maybe this is what you want. Maybe this is not what you want. But this is something to consider when you're adding or when you're registering map services with, as items within Portal. All right. So that experience that Jeff just demoed is, again, one of the common um, items I'm finding that I work with customers to, um, to change. And one of the ways we change that is to federate the server with Portal. So when, when an ArcGIS server is federated with Portal, Portal takes over the identity management of ArcGIS server. And all services that ArcGIS server um, can support will uh, respect the Portal's, Portal's authority, Portal's authentication. That second prompt doesn't happen when your ArcGIS server is federated with your Portal. Um, so that's why it's common reason to do this is to provide a single sign-on experience uh, to sort of avoid the second prompt. Um, it also provides uh, imp an improvement in manageability because when you have an ArcGIS server and a portal um, deployed but they're not federated, then you're, f you're, you're really managing two 
systems independently and you're having to deal with security on the server and the security on the portal and it's easy to uh, make a mistake or to overlook something. So it's, a, it's very, very attractive from a manageability perspective. Now, there are cases where you may not want to federate. Um, common ones are that, that our products are not, we don't expect to ever have them on the same version because federation does require that portal and server are on the same version or if they're um, in vastly different geographic locations, um, high latency connections between them uh, may not be, that may not be a, a, a good case to federate. So you don't really want to federate your portal with a server that's in another country um, or across the, the, you know, across the country. And I'll go ahead and turn it back to Jeff. All right. I'll on federating. Quick demo here of federation. So I'm logged in again as an administrator. I will go to my organization, edit settings, and servers. And this, this page right here is where uh, you would go to federate uh, an ArcGIS server with Portal. Now, in order to do it, I'll click Add Server, and I need two URLs. I'll copy and paste them from here. First URL is the one with the web adapter, typically. And the second URL is the administrator URL, typically without the web adapter and we need a username and password. Now what happens here when I click add? I'm telling ArcGIS server, okay, suddenly I'm, uh, security is handled by portal and, and server, whatever security settings you were previously defined are, are null and void at this point. Now portal's handling it all. What also happens is if I click on my content here, let me save this, you'll notice <coughs> <clears throat> the existing services that I had published to ArcGIS Server all became imported into Portal as individual items. And now, by default, all these items are not shared with anyone. So only, only the administrator at this point can access these items. And now it's the administrator's responsibility to define individual uh, or share the items with individual groups uh, as desired. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, as you start deploying um, ArcGIS Server and Portal and you do things like federation or use identity stores with these products, um, what you might find, especially if you use an enterprise identity store like Active Directory or LDAP, is that um, that, that identity, the, your, your Active Directory over time, you know, users get added to groups, they get removed from groups but your portal doesn't necessarily reflect that. And that's, that can be frustrating. It can be a, um, an administrative burden that you don't want. And so a feature that we, we made available is called Enterprise Groups in Portal. And it's a way to link the two. This was a, this was a user demanded feature because, um, because it became a, almost like a full-time job, you know, finding out what changed in my AD and then pushing those changes over to Portal. And again, I, I wouldn't want you guys to, to have to do that um, if, you, if you can avoid it. So in this case, what we can do here is we can tie a Active Directory or LDAP group to a portal group. And if a new user is added or removed from the Active Directory group, that user is added or removed from the enterprise group. And it's a relatively simple change. Um, we change the way users are managed in in a, in a specific group to use an enterprise group. We choose the associated group from our active directory, and that's it. They're start, they start syncing at that time. And I'll go ahead and show, uh, have, have Jeff here, go ahead and show us how that's done. All right, thanks, Craig. First thing, in order to uh, utilize the enterprise groups, the first thing we need to do is configure portal to communicate with our uh, enterprise identity stores. So what I'm gonna do here is open up a new tab and go to the portal administrator directory. This is the over 7443 ArcGIS slash portal admin. I'm already logged on as an administrator here, so I'll click on security and config. And these, the user store configuration and the group store configuration, these two right here, are what I need to update. So if I click update identity store, um, we need, we've got the uh, JSON strings that need to be input here that correspond, uh, tell portal how to communicate with the active directory or LDAP. Now, in this case, I've already got that saved for ease of, make it easy to copy and paste. We do have all this information in our help documentation under the API reference here to know exactly what parameters need to be put in where. Um, and I'll update groups. 
and I'll click Update Configuration. Now when I do this, Portal is now configured to communicate with it, but it doesn't automatically import users or groups for that matter. It's not like ArcGIS Server where suddenly you can view every, everyone and every user and every role out there. Um, so if I go back now to the Portal Home application and click on Groups, and I will create a group. And let's call this group Demo2. Now, demo two. you'll see we've got an option here under users. Typically, we, they can choose to join by invitation only, or, or users can apply to join the group. Since we've defined that group store, um, or linked to the group store to the uh, enterprise system, we have this third option here to link an enterprise group, or from an enterprise group. And at this point, I can search for and select an enterprise group in my system to link this portal group that I just created to the corresponding enterprise group. So if I click, I can search for it. It's giving me a, a list of groups here. Maybe I want to choose this uh, server GIS publishers group. Select the group and save. So what, what this does now, and again, this doesn't automatically add all the users to the group or anything like that, but it means that any portal user that's a, already a member of the group within Active Directory will automatically become a member of this group. It doesn't have to be maintained. You don't need to go in after the fact and add users or remove users or anything like that. That's all refreshed and maintained automatically. And that's the advantage of using linking a portal group to an enterprise group. Okay, thank you, Jeff. So, yeah, so you can't see those users in the portal? No. to actually see who's yet. That's all maintained within Active Directory. It's not listed within Portal. OK, so now we'll talk a little bit about SAML. And SAML is, is one of my favorite features of Portal. We actually deploy Portal sometimes just to get SAML. SAML's like bacon. You can sprinkle it on anything, and it makes it better. Um, yeah, so what, what SAML gives us is it gives us the ability to use a local identity store it allows us to use a remote identity store. If you want to deploy Portal in, in Azure or Amazon, but you still want to use single sign-on with your Active Directory, you can do that with SAML. Um, it also provides you with a way of doing single sign-on um, enterprise logins with your organization, plus supporting built-in users for things like contractors and kind of semi-trusted users. So it's, and it's the only way you can do that. So it's really, really a very powerful, um, powerful way to go in terms of um, identity and, and it is the industry standard for single sign-on um, these days. It does require an identity provider as I mentioned, so this is something you've got to kind of figure out, does your IT department have one? If you're part of a, a government agency, is there one you can roll up to? Um, this works with CAT cards, it works with PKI, it works with biometric, there's really no limit. And the way it works, um, and the reason why it's, I can say that uh, you know, with impunity, is that um, in, in SAML, a client will connect to Portal Portal will redirect the client, this is the key, over to the identity provider. At this point, this client is not talking to Portal anymore. It's talking to the identity provider, which means if, you know, if, this, is a, um, if this is a hospital and the hospital has biometric authentication, the client will have the biometric um, infrastructure, the identity provider will have the biometric infrastructure. You don't have to worry about doing it with our products. It'll just work. The identity provider will authenticate the user and the client will supply the authentication back to Portal, and Portal will validate the user. Now, this looks complicated, but it all executes in a matter of seconds. Especially if you have, um, if you have single sign-on enabled, your users probably won't realize this is happening unless they're really, really savvy. It'll just look like their screen flacker, flickers for a second. They just, like, they open up, open up Portal, they hit log in with my identity provider, and then the screen flashes, and then they're in. They're, oh, that's cool. That's kind of how that works. And I'll go ahead and uh, turn it back to Jeff to show us yeah. how to uh, enable that in Portal. Enabling SAML in Portal is actually very simple. So I'm logged into the Portal uh, home application as an administrator. And again, once it, I'm under uh, my organization here at the top. And I'll click on Edit Settings. And I'll go down to the Security tab down here. We've got a couple options here, but the one we're interested in here is the Enterprise Logins via SAML. So we need to do... It's a, it's a two-step process, and I've already, uh, I've already done the, the, the first step here. But we need to go ahead and set the identity provider. And 
and I will call this ADFS, and you can choose whether you want your users to be able to, uh, users that log in, whether you want them to be added automatically to portal or whether you want to be able to selectively or preemptively add them yourself. Um, the metadata regarding the enterprise identity provider can be supplied through a URL or a file. Uh, I'll use a file here. Here's a file, and then I click Set Identity Provider, and I'm done within Portal. Now, the, the second option is to click the Get Service Provider, and that will generate another uh, XML metadata file that you need to supply to your IT department to get them to import it into the uh, SAML or into the identity provider so they, it's expecting a, uh, or so it understands a request coming from the, the portal. But once that's done, and you click Save, You'll see an option, well, let me sign out as admin. When I click sign in now, I suddenly have two options here. I can sign in using the ADFS account, that's the SAML uh, Enterprise Identity Store that I just added, or I could sign in using a built-in or an ArcGIS account. And this is the, the value of the SAML as Greg described is that, you know, suddenly if you've got external contractors that are not members of your enterprise active methods. directory. This way or this way. Yeah. This, is, this is how it can be used. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so um, in closing, I would say uh, uh, you look into SAML if you can. Uh, it's going to typically make your, your experience better. Um, this session was about ArcGIS Server Security and Introduction, Portal Security Introduction. Um, please take our survey, go to the Esri Events app, search for ArcGIS for Server Security Introduction, and to give us a review if you know if this was good, tell us. But if it sucked, tell us. Like we want to improve it um, so that we're back here next year or at some of the other sessions, and uh, you know, really giving you the the, the resources you want.